too, as well. And I got to thinking that events like this are a bit like heaven will be. That there's, uh, you know, the, the praise and the joy and the excitement and all that. And then there's the sense of fellowship. As, won't it be wonderful as we look across uh, the sea of faces and recognize this one and then that one and another one? And, you know, with some people we'll be so excited, others will be surprised. Was it you here? <laughs> wow. <laughs> It's really been wonderful for me to be here, and I'm just very, very grateful and humble for the invitation. I thank James. His, his staff has just been uh, wonderful to me. I've, my wife and I have really enjoyed the time here and the wonderful people that we've met. I would like to tell you this. There are places where one is invited to come, preach, and the, you, you, you do, and go and preach, and you enjoy the invitation. Um, and then it's a joy to hear the other speakers, but sometimes it doesn't appear that maybe their own personal uh, interaction, their own, I don't know how to say this, but maybe they're, they're better on the platform than they are when you get up close to them. Is that, I don't know how to say it without sounding uncharitable, I guess it's because it's an uncharitable thought is the reason. <laughs> I'm going to preach today on perfection and love. Um, but uh, at this conference, I would like to say that every person that I've met, every man that has spoken here, I've been deeply and personally challenged. I, I don't know if you had this sense or not, but I had this sense somehow or another that every man who spoke was speaking to me, that it was divinely arranged for my own uh, personal life. But then the, the double blessing as I got close to these blokes and found them just to be tremendous men of God, spirits of God that just touched my life, warm, personable, unaffected, and, and um, you know, unpretentious, humble people. And it was just a, a joy to be with the fellowship. And I'm grateful to James just for the privilege of being in, invited to just be a part of this event. It's been very great. He has a wonderful, James has a wonderful uh, vision for the body of Christ and a great, um, wonderful sense that God has great things to say from disparate corners of the kingdom. And uh, he really has a, I've detected a great burden that the Lord has laid on his shoulders to bring those widely diverse areas of the body of Christ together and at least, at least uh, you know, let them exchange telegrams uh, to know that we're all here. And it's really been a great experience for me and I, I really am grateful for it as, as always. Of course, uh, you know, James doesn't have to ask me back or anything like that, but he will have to answer to God for that. But <laughs> it's been a wonderfully balanced uh, conference. Um, uh, I believe that uh, there's something that's been said here uh, by one speaker or another to offend almost everybody. Uh, and just in case that uh, it, you haven't been offended yet, I felt that I would launch out now where angels fear to tread, and I know what that makes me, uh, and preach to a whole room full of Baptists on the book of Revelation. So if you have your Bibles... Let's take those now and turn to the book of Revelation. Now, if you'll just uh, look with me at the very first few words. The revelation of Jesus Christ. Not revelations. The revelation of Jesus Christ. I want you to, uh, if you're armed, I want you to put away your guns, okay? If you've worn a sword into the place, lay it under your chair. Because I'm going to approach you on the subject of the book of Revelation in a bit of an unorthodox way. And I know that there will be uh, sacredly held and 
profoundly believed understandings of the book of Revelation which are precious to you, which you learned and heard in vacation Bible school and have read in countless books that have reiterated virtually the same approach to understanding the book of Revelation for years and years and years, perhaps for your whole life. And I don't want anything that I say today to threaten your convictions. I'm not, I'm not saying at all that those convictions are wrong or anybody's convictions are wrong. I'm simply offering you an alternative view of the book as an entity. Um, and so, therefore, I, I'm going to invite you to, um, without feeling threatened or without feeling in any way that this is some kind of a great uh, theological compromise or something, to, to just sort of enter in with me into the book of Revelation in a new way. To say, Lord, show me a new thing, a fresh thing from the book of Revelation. Sometimes, someone said, I can't remember who now, but someone said he believed that at some point all the Christians in the world should uh, read through their Bibles and read only all the verses that they have never underlined. And I, I don't know all that he meant by that, but I think that in part he meant by that that we, we spend after the initial contact with Christ and our initial entry into the kingdom, we spend most of the rest of our walk with Jesus just trying to re-emphasize those things which we learned in the first few days, first few hours of our walk with Christ. And we just keep building up uh, on those foundations. There are, there are probably among most uh, evangelical Christians two areas that seem to excite strangely enough, seem to excite the most immediate controversy. The first is on the gifts of the Spirit. And the second seems to be on end-time prophecy. Let me just uh, say this to you straight away. and This is not going to be a sermon about end-time prophecy per se. Now, I know that straight away you say to yourself, how can anybody preach on the book of Revelation and not preach a sermon about end-time prophecy? Now, just hold on to your seats for a minute, okay? Uh, you know, I love you. Everybody say, we love you too. I'm really glad to know that. Because, you see... The reason I'm going to preach this sermon from the book of Revelation that's not about end time prophecy is because I don't really believe that the book of Revelation is really about end time prophecy. I believe that it has implications to end time prophecy, but about is a strong word. It's not about end time prophecy. It's about Jesus. The revelation of Jesus Christ over against history, above history, within history, underneath history, and beyond the end of history, but it's not about any particular segment of history, even and including in time, the end of human time. Now, having said all that then, uh, let me just say that I'd like to read a lengthy passage of Scripture because I don't want anybody to think I'm just going to take some particular little half sentence out of context and uh, make it say whatever I want it to say. I want us to get the sweep and flow of the book. So my text for this afternoon is the book of Revelation. So we'll just read this and then we'll have a benediction. Should be around about two in the morning or so. No, I want to read some passages of Scripture. So just stay with me now, and as I read them, I'll announce the next, and you can just follow with me, and we'll read them in, in order, if you will. Okay. The first is 1-1, one, one, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. He sent and signified it by his angel unto his servant John. Verse 10. I was in the Spirit on the Lord's day, and heard behind me a great voice, as of a trumpet, saying, I am Alpha and Omega, the first and the last. And what thou seest, 
Now that, that right there, if you just have a pen with you, that is key. You cannot read the book of Revelation with any intellectual honesty unless you see it across the word see, saw. It's, it's, a, it's a book about beholding. Okay. What thou seest, write in a book and send it unto the seven churches which are in Asia and all the churches which ever will be. Verse 12, and I turned to see the voice that spoke with me. And being turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment to the foot, and girded about the breasts with, golden, with a golden girdle. His head and his hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes were like flame of fire, and his feet like fine bronze as if they burned in a furnace, and his voice like the sound of many waters. And he had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword, and his countenance was as the sun shineth in its strength. And when I saw him, I fell at his feet as dead, and he laid his right hand upon me, saying unto me, Fear not, I am the first and the last. I am he that liveth and was dead. Behold, I am alive forevermore. Amen. And have the keys of hell and of death. Now, if you will, just skip over to chapter 4, and now we'll read just verse here and there as we move along. After this I looked, and behold, a door was opened in heaven, and the first voice that I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me, which said, Come up here, and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the Spirit, and behold, a throne was set in heaven, and one sat on the throne. Chapter 5. And I saw in the right hand of him that sat on the throne a scroll written within and on the back and sealed with seven seals. Chapter 6, And I saw the Lamb open one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the living creatures, saying, Come. Chapter 7, And after these things I saw four angels standing on the four corners of the earth, holding the four winds of the earth, that the wind should not blow upon the earth, nor on the sea, nor on any tree. Verse 9, Verse 9 of the 7th chapter. And after this I beheld, and lo, a great multitude, which no man could number, of all nations and kindred and people and tongues, stood before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed with white robes and psalms and palms in their hands, and cried with a loud voice, saying, Salvation to our God, who sitteth upon the throne and unto the Lamb. And all the angels stood round about the throne, about the elders and the four living creatures, and fell before the throne on their faces and worshipped God, saying, Amen blessing and glory and wisdom and thanksgiving and honor and power and might be unto our God forever and ever. Amen. Chapter 8, verse 2. And I saw the seven angels who stood before God, and to them were given seven trumpets. And another angel came and stood at the altar having a golden censer. And there was given unto him much incense that he should offer it with the prayers of all the saints upon the golden altar which was before the throne. And the smoke of the incense which came with the prayers of the saints ascended up before God out of the angel's hand. And the angel took the censer and filled it with fire from the altar and cast it upon the earth. And there were voices and thunderclaps and lightnings and an earthquake. Chapter 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth. And to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. Chapter 10. And I saw another mighty angel come down from heaven clothed with a cloud. And a rainbow was upon his head and his face was as though it were of the sun, and his feet were like pillars of fire. Chapter 12. And there appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with sun, and the moon under her feet, and upon her head a crown of twelve stars. And she, being with child, cried, travailing in birth, and pained to be delivered. And there appeared another wonder in heaven, and behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman who was ready to be delivered, to devour her child as soon as as it was born, chapter 13. And this, by the way, let me say in passing, I believe that the first two verses of chapter 13 and the first two verses of chapter 14 are actually the condensation of the entire book. And I stood upon the sand of the sea, 
And I saw a beast rise out of the sea, having seven heads and ten horns, and upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the names of blasphemy. And the beast which I saw was like a leopard, and his feet were like the feet of a bear, and his mouth like the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his throne and great authority. Chapter 14. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion, and with him an hundred and forty and four thousand, having his father's name written in their foreheads. And I heard a voice from heaven like the voice of many waters, like the voice of a great thunder. And I heard the voice of harpers harping with their harps. And they sang as it were a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. And no man could learn that song but the hundred and forty and four thousand who were the redeemed from the earth. Chapter 15. And I saw another sign in heaven, great and marvelous, seven angels having the seven last plagues, for in them is filled up the wrath of God. Chapter 16 and verse 13. And I saw three unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon and out of the mouth of the beast and out of the mouth of the prophet and the fault and out of the mouth of the false prophet. Chapter 17, verse 6. And I saw the woman drunk with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great wonder. Chapter 18. And after these things, I saw another angel come down from heaven, having great power, and the earth was made bright with his glory. Chapter 19, beginning with verse 11. And I saw heaven opened, and behold, a white horse. And he that sat upon him was called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he doth judge and make war. His eyes were like the flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew, but he himself. He was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies that were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. And out of his mouth goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations, and he shall rule them with a rod of iron. And he treadeth the winepress of the fierceness and wrath of Almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. Chapter 20 and verse 4. And I saw thrones, and they that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And I saw the souls of them that were beheaded for the witness of Jesus and for the word of God, who had not worshipped the beast, neither his image, neither had received his mark in their foreheads or in their hands, and they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. Chapter 21. And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. Remember chapter 13? and there was no more sea. Chapter 22, And he showed me, or I saw, a pure river of water of life, clear as crystal, proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. And in the midst of it, on either side of the river, was there the tree of life, which bore twelve kinds of fruits, and yielded her fruit every month, and the leaves of the trees were for the healing of the nations. And there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the Lamb shall be in it. And his servants shall serve him, and they shall see his face, and his name shall be in their foreheads, and there shall be no more night there. And they need no lamp, neither light of the sun, for the Lord God giveth them light, and they shall reign forever and forever. Verse 16. I, Jesus, have sent mine angel to testify unto you these things in the churches. I am the root and offspring of David, the bright morning star. The spirit and the bride say, Come, let him that is that heareth say, Come. Let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. For I testify unto every man that heareth these words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part from the tree of life and out of the holy city. For the things which are written in this book... For he who testifieth these things saith, Surely I come quickly. Amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Now let's pray before we say that last amen. Heavenly Father, I tremble before you and before your word. Lord, I don't want to say anything that's not pleasing in your sight. I pray that your Holy Spirit will so impregnate the very words that the Word will be alive in them. Lord, I'm not asking you that everybody in this room agree with me. I am asking that even at the point of disagreement, 
that we may find the agreement of spirit in the Lordship of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. Lord, I believe you for this. I praise you for it in advance. I'm praying that when we leave here today, that we will say one to another, today I've heard from God. I believe you for this. In the wonderful name Jesus, the strong Son of God. Amen. When I was uh, just a wild young buck in high school, lost as a ball in high weeds and out in the world, a group of us went to one night to a, a roadhouse uh, up between Baltimore and Washington, a tavern, and we were drinking and carousing in there. A, a friend from the basketball team that played on the basketball team with this boy named Brooke came in. And he had with him a beautiful girl. None of us had ever seen. She must have been from another town. And uh, Brooke was a very quiet boy, very um, shy, reserved. And we were astonished to see him with this uh, beauty. There was a boy with us who was uh, really uh, three sheets to the wind. His name was Danny. And Danny was uh, loud and boisterous and rowdy and completely out of control. And he said, I'm going back there and find out who this girl is. And uh, so he, before anybody could say anything to him, Danny went back and pushed his way into the booth where Brooke and this beautiful girl were and pushed himself in by this girl and put his arm around her. He said, well, who are you? What are you doing with Brooke? You don't want to be with this guy. Uh, he said, come with me. Come on, leave him and come with me. I've got a beautiful new car outside. And let's get to know each other. And he's pushing. I, I heard, I heard uh, Brooke say, don't do that. It just had a kind of a penetrating quality about it. And, uh, and Danny began to ask the girl for a kiss. He said, come on, give us a kiss. Give me a kiss. And um, I heard Brooks say one more time, Danny, don't. And it just uh, shot through my being. I decided I'd race back there to the back uh, booth and rescue my friend and get him out of there. Before I could move, uh, Danny leaned over and kissed the girl right on the cheek. And Brooke jumped up and grabbed him by the front of his shirt and punched him backward through a plate glass window into the parking lot. I looked over into the bar area and I saw the owner of the roadhouse reaching for the telephone and he was calling the cops. So we jumped up, raced into the parking lot. We grabbed Danny, who was unconscious, threw him into the back seat of the car, and we tried to get out of there and get up to Baltimore, Washington Pike before the police could arrive. And we're driving along, I was furious. He was cut glass all over him and, and uh, drunk. And the whole thing had ruined our evening. The police were after us. So I climbed over the front seat. Somebody else was driving. I climbed over the front seat into the back, and I just began slapping him to make him come awake. He waked up and looked up at me, and I said, you fool, you fool. I said, couldn't you hear him? Couldn't you hear what he said? Didn't you hear him when he said, don't? Didn't you hear the tone in his voice? Didn't you hear what he said, don't? He said, I heard him, I heard him. I underestimated the depth of the relationship. I think that... Uh, I think that the problem with the way most people read the book of Revelation is that they are trying to figure out whether to take it symbolically or allegorically or literally. And the problem is that the answer is none of the above. The answer is that God wants us to take it seriously. I think that, that what happens is we, we read the book of Revelation from a cultural and existential situation which denies us access into the, into the heart and soul, into the guts of the book, and we miss the message. It causes us to underestimate the depth of the relationship between Jesus Christ and his church in this earth, both now and eternally. You see, the book is not written by a Westerner for Westerners. John the Apostle was an Oriental, had an Oriental mindset, an Oriental understanding, and he wrote an Oriental book for Orientals to read. 
And you're not going to access this book through the Western-style Greco-Roman door and bend it around our cultural understandings and make the book of Revelation read like a, a Western-style history book. If you do, I promise you that there will, you may get some truth out of it, you may get a great deal of truth out of it, but the great heart and soul of the book of Revelation will never be revealed to you because this is not a Western-style book. This is not the book of Romans here. There's a reason that the book of Romans is called the book of Romans. It's because it was written to Europeans. Therefore, it has a, a, a logical European approach. But this is a book that was written by an Oriental to Orientals to the churches that are in Asia. And unless you can enter in through the, through the Oriental door, I tell you there will be a great deal of the book that'll be, that will be stolen from you because of, your, because of our cultural um, obsession with our own way of life, our own ethnocentrism. Let me give you just an example, if I might. There, uh, there are two ways of viewing time. One is polychronic. Uh, that's the kind of time theory that most Asiatics have, Africans, Latin Americans. And it's the, it says that uh, it's not about a point in time or successive points in time that form a ribbon of motion from one place to another. It's about being. It's about relationships. It's about a multiplicity of things going on in any given moment. But monochronic, that's a Western style way of thinking about time, that says that you put a pin down here and you unroll the tape measure in one direction and each point on the tape measure is a moment in time. Tick tock, tick tock, tick tock, tick tock. So that you move directly and, and the shortest distance between two points is a straight line. And that if you delay at any point, you've slowed the thing down. This is what Lewis Carroll was laughing about. The, Adulpated rabbit plunges from one mad scene to the other, crying, I'm late, I'm late, I'm late for a very important date. And A wasn't late, B, nothing in the thing is important. But it's about obeying time. Well, that's the reason that most Westerners, when they try to experience the mission work of the Orient or Africa or Latin America, that the greatest point of frustration is at the point of time. I can remember when I first went to Mexico. I have a broken down truck. And I'll be sitting on the porch talking about this broken down truck. <laughs> I'd say, well, let's fix it. They'd say, yes, we've got to get it fixed. I'd jump up. All right, good. Where, where do we go? I'd say, wait, wait, wait. <laughs> have a seat. Sit down. They said, does anybody know anybody that can fix a truck? I'd say, yes. You know. Martinez down the street, he fixes trucks. I said, good, let's go to Martinez's house. They said, wait, does anybody know anybody else? We named five or six. I said, well, let's choose one of them. They said, wait a minute, will you? He said, when do you think we ought to get it fixed? I said, like now. They said, well, what's your hurry? What's the, what's the issue here? But you see, I was moving on this timeline, this monochronic in their understanding. I was about that truck in human history. But they were about the front porch. <laughs> see, they were about us being together. They were dealing with a whole variety of issues relational. The substance of the thing became almost... almost... Uh, inconsequential. The truck was there. Oh, fine. The truck will be all right. It, uh, you know, at some point or another. This causes a great deal of frustration in homes. I am decidedly monochronic. I, I, I'm, I'm almost uh, obsessively monochronic. My wife moves on a sort of a Latin American view of time. See? She feels like if we arrive in the same week as an event, that we are more or less on time, you see. Now, the problem is that if, you, if one enters the book of Revelation on a Western-style, monochronic view of time, 
then we make the mistake that I find in most books about the book of Revelation is that chapter 1 is where it starts. And then comes chapter 2, and then chapter 3, and then chapter 4, and then finally to chapter 22. And that if you will start at chapter 1 and work your way progressively through, step by step by step, it will define for you those things which are going to happen in various points of time in human history. And you can work your way along the ribbon of monochronic Western understanding of time. And therefore, you will understand everything that happens along that ribbon. The only problem is, that's not what this book is about. Let me just invite you into an oriental art museum. It's like nothing you've ever seen before. When you enter it, the door closes behind you and the room shifts, whirling, so that the walls absorb the door. Now you can no longer tell where you entered and there's no place marked to exit. You are completely surrounded by the most beautiful pictures you've ever seen in your life. They're all on poles and they revolve so that actually each picture is a vast multiplicity of pictures. So that you're seeing a whirling kaleidoscope of artwork all around you whirling, whirling. At times, one will stop and then revolve again and again and again. So that you stand in the center of the room, tell me which one is the first picture and which one is the last picture. What a typical American question. Where do we start? What do we do next? How do we make these pictures stop spinning? <laughs> Let's number them. <laughs> then we can make a catalog and figure out a way to sell them. <laughs> you see, the problem with a monochronic interpretation of the book of Revelation is that it is a Jim Dandy way to sell books about end time prophecy. But it misses the, splen the splendid, munificent glory of the museum. For just a moment, forget chapter 1, chapter 2, chapter 3, and stand in the floor and watch the pretty pictures and see whirling, spinning, magnificent things. Angels, dragons, armies, God, Whew. rainbows, thunder, lightning. Some of the pictures are even making sounds so that you can almost see the sound of a trumpet, a multidimensional assault on your entire sensory package so that you are caught up in it. The pictures whirl. Now, as you stand there, you suddenly begin to realize that there are certain similarities that these eight pictures over here seem to look like these pictures over here. These pictures kind of are like those. Well, they're different, but they're, well, I see some things and those over here are like those and suddenly, all of a sudden, you just realize that when this thing stops, you're not going to remember any of these pictures exactly that what you're going to remember is the, is the sense of ideas, themes, uh, highly subjective and deeply emotive whirlwinds of emotional transmission that you've received in this event. Now, you're just about where John was when he sat at the mouth of a cave on the Lord's Day, praying in the Spirit like he did every Lord's Day, maybe like he did every day. And all of a sudden, he's catapulted into a whirling kaleidoscope of transcendent beauty beyond anything he ever dreamt of or imagined. You see, I don't think you can, like, read the book of Revelation. I think you experience the book of Revelation. I think that until you just 
enter into the wind tunnel of the apocalypse. <laughs> that you're going to miss a huge element of it. What we want to do, we want to know what the third toe on the left foot of the second beast, you know, what does that mean? And I think that if John was, as he stumbled out of that cave, that day when it was over with his hair, you know, out like this, and his eyes. And we said, uh, do you believe that the, uh, do you believe that the beast that had the feet of a leopard, was, would that represent the Medio-Persian Empire? Would that be more or less the, fas the rise and fall of fascism in Eastern and Western Europe? I think he would say, man, you just haven't been where I've been. <laughs> you know, this is a guy who is sitting praying in exile staring into the face of a world that has gone mad politically. The Roman Empire is collapsing. Tribes out of the Black Forest that people thought were barbarians are attacking and sacking cities that were considered absolutely impregnable. Savages with horns on their helmets are making a mockery of Roman legions that had held the world in a grip of enforced peace. The church is being plowed under the chariot wheels of one tyrant or another. Saints are being decapitated. He's the last apostle, the last living touch with the living experience of Jesus. And there, at his death, the church is going to be plunged into a new era of second generation Christianity. And nothing, nothing makes sense. He himself has been exiled to a gravel pit. And day after day after day, that frail old man trudges up a steep mountainside with a basket on the back of his, strapped to his back with a band around his head carrying a load of gravel that would crush a younger man. And as he claws his way along the path, he says, Why are you keeping me alive? Peter is gone. James is gone. Why am I still alive? Matthew is gone. Luke is gone. Why am I still alive? Why do you have me in this gravel pit called Patmos? Why do I alone yet remain alive? Then on the one day of rest, he crawls into the mouth of a cave and begins to pray in the Holy Ghost. And wow! He shot straight into the ionosphere of spiritual experience. I don't believe that it ever dawned on him for a moment that 2,000 years later, petty parochial little minds would prowl through the pages of the apocalypse and try to explain historical events that they read on their front page. I don't believe it ever dawned on him. Look, the, this book of Revelation is an event. It's a love letter from God to a church that's about to be hurled into historical events that are, that are monumental. It's God saying, dear church, things are going to go crazy now for a while. Don't be shaken. The devil will underestimate the depth of the relationship. The world will underestimate the depth of the relationship. But the church daren't underestimate the depth of the relationship. It's going to get nuts here for a while. Then it's going to get really nuts. Then it's going to get totally nuts. Then it'll get all right. And it'll stay like that forever. I love you. Signed, Jesus. And we want to draw timelines on our living rooms, graphs, charts. Make historical and interpretive application of the book of Revelation to minute events of circumstantial history which simply will not bear the weight of it. Middle 1930s in Poland, the evangelical scholars determined that according to the book of Revelation, it was manifestly obvious that Adolf Hitler was the Antichrist. They were 100% sure of it. 
and that Benito Mussolini was a false prophet. The beast and the prophet of fascism. World domination seemed imminent. But no worry, no worry. We're going to be raptured before the beast arrives in Warsaw. But when they waked up one morning and there were Panzer tanks parked outside their churches, the evangelicals, not by ones and twos, but in their numbers, lost their faith and fell to despair because they tried to impose on their own immediate historicity and interpretation of the book of Revelation, which had absolutely a, a much grander, much more powerful meaning. Not less than they meant it to mean, more, infinitely more than they meant it to mean. This is, a, this is an eternal telegram from God. This is not a puny little 21st century history lesson. Well, what are the great concepts? First of all, the greatest concept of the book of Revelation is that this conflict in which we find ourselves, both as participants and as victims, has a supernatural tone to it. You see, this book is not just about, it's not just about soldiers and armies and kings and queens and princes and tyrants and dynasties that come and go. Why does the book have such a flamboyant, manifestly supernatural tone to it? Because what God is trying to say is, look, when somebody's standing with a sword at your throat, this is a conflict that goes behind him. There's, a, there's an angel. Behind that, there's supernatural beings. There's forces, dynamics that are moving, parole, paroling uh, through the heavens in a magnificent way. There are cosmic clashes going on around you and above you and underneath you. This is not about this soldier and you in this house struggling for control of the moment. It's not about Caesar or Nero or Caligula or this empire or that empire. It's about huge, grand things. There are magnificent things going on. Wars in heaven. There's about angels. There's about demons. So therefore we ask ourselves, is this about, is this about Hitler? Yes. No. Is Hitler the Antichrist or was Nebuchadnezzar the Antichrist? Yes. No. Yes. No. Unless you read the book of Revelation, <laughs> that way you're going to just get imprisoned. Is Deng Xiaoping, is the, is the spirit of Antichrist at work in him? Well, sure, yeah. Is he the Antichrist? No. Yes. No. <laughs> Hitler's and Stalin's and Mao's and Idi Amin's and Saddam Hussein's will come and go. They will lust for the blood of the church with a lethal hatred. But behind them there is a mind of monolithic evil. This is not about you, he says. This is between me and the devil. And the town ain't big enough for both of us. So hold fast. Because I'm going to like settle this thing. Whew. Do you see? You see, when you get that, who, to whom was John writing? He was writing to people who were living through the bloodiest, most unimaginable, unexplainable events of human history. Every day they picked up their newspaper. Nations are rising and falling. Dynasties are changing. Things that they thought were permanently fixed on the landscape of human history are being swept away in a moment. And things that they had been told would never be again are being are rising up. John is, God is saying through John the Revelator, this is because there is a conflict between angels and demons, between God and the devil, between earth and heaven, between heaven and hell, that is a transcendent cosmic conflict. Therefore, do not be shaken and do not take matters into your own hands. 
You cannot force the kingdom. You cannot make the kingdom. You cannot create the kingdom. You cannot even pave the way for the kingdom. This is mine, saith the Lord, and I will settle it because this so far goes beyond you. But you see, what we do is we take the book of Revelation and we clutch it to our little American chest and we shout, mine, mine, mine. This is going to help me to explain who Hitler was and who this one was and this one was. So you have little nitwit lectures on television about great big uh, computer banks in Switzerland. And you just want to say, what? Well, I mean... And the problem with them is the computer bank burns down and they have to start over. They say, well, we knew, we knew that. We knew that. I meant to say that on last week's telecast. And so, you know, they say, this is who Saddam Hussein is. And he gets, you know, rises, falls, lives, dies, whatever. I'm making no predictions here. But... See, this happens, that happens, and so everything, everybody rushes to the television set and says, let me explain that to you. I can explain that to you. That's right here in the 14th chapter of the book of Revelation. I know that last week is not what I told you, but now I'm telling you this. It's just astonishing. It's almost, it's almost horrifying. You can almost see the old apostle there saying to him, will you let go of that? And open your eyes. This is about a conflict that began between Lucifer and God in heaven before you were and is going to continue after you are. This is cosmic. You see, we read the book of Revelation like the little boy who became so full of himself, so proud, so arrogant almost that his parents just felt like they had to humble him. They had to humble the little fellow. So they took him to the Grand Canyon. They took him to the Grand Canyon and they said, now look at that. How does that make you feel? The guide said, that thing is a mile deep, straight down. The little boy said, a mile straight down? Wow. And the parents said, we finally impressed him with something bigger than he is. We finally impressed him with something. That night he went in, wrote in his little diary and went to sleep and the parents sneaked in, opened his diary while he was asleep and he said, Today, I spit a mile. <laughs> you see, you, you can't define the Grand Canyon in terms of your little old drop of spit. No more than you can look into the cosmic conflict of the book of Revelation and understand it totally in terms of this morning's headline. The second great theme is about dungeons and dragons. There is a beast, a consuming, warring, hateful, lustful, murderous beast. He hates you. He hates you because you look like your dad. And he hates your dad. He's there ready to devour you. Does the woman who gives birth to the male child mean the Virgin Mary giving birth to Jesus? The Old Covenant giving birth to the New Covenant? Israel giving birth to Christianity? Which of these? Yes! Yes! The substance of the thing is that God says don't be shaken when you're imprisoned, when the dragon opens his yawning mouth to devour you, and when you see your prophets sawn asunder so that their entrails are ripped out, and when you are destitute, and when you are plowed under the chariot wheels of tyrants, don't be shaken in your believing. I love you. I love you and I'm still here. Now look, I don't want to... I'm already so far out I can feel the ice cracking under my feet. But, but listen to me. Let me say a word to you. Can I just please, in all humility about this issue of the rapture, 
I eagerly await the return of Christ to receive his bride. In fact, it would just thrill me no end if it would come before the end of this sermon. <laughs> but the, the point for me is not whether or not you believe in the rapture of the church. The point for me is why you might believe in the rapture of the church. I know Americans who are sincere in their conviction of the rapture of the church. But the basis of their sincerity is that God won't allow his church to go through these things. But the problem is, he always has. He always has. What about the martyrs whose heads are cut off? What about those who have been tortured and done to death and slaughtered like sheep for the sake of the name of Jesus? What makes us better than they were? Gee, the greatest, I think it's wonderful for God to prosper us all, give us health, wealth, wisdom, and rapture us out from behind the wheel of a Cadillac. Hallelujah to Jesus. Man, I can get into that gospel. The only problem is, you see, it's totally irrelevant for a man who's holding a dying baby on his lap in Somalia. He doesn't even know what you're talking about. For him, the answer, the question is, does God care about me in this mess? And the answer at the end of the book of Revelation is, yes, yes, I'm the Alpha. I was before this mess began. I'm the Omega. I'm going to be there when this mess is all over with. I am the Alpha and Omega during torture and pain and imprisonment and victory and defeat and move forward and three steps back. I always was. I always will be. I am that I am that I am that I am. And I love you. Thus saith the Lord. The fact of the matter is, it's even an unworthy and sinful lust for us to desire to avoid the dungeons and dragons. God says, open your eyes, you see that dragon? Okay, that's fine, see him. You don't have to deny it. This is not about becoming oblivious to reality. You see that dungeon? Do you see that torture? Fine, okay, open your eyes and see it. But you haven't seen the final page yet. See, the book of Revelation is about seeing things. And what we want to do is not see. I don't want to see torture. I don't want to see tribulation. Oh, somebody says, well, that, does, that means tribulation and tribulations with a small t and a plural and all the rest, but it doesn't mean like tribulation, tribulation. The thing is this, listen, the great tribulation is the one you're going through. Some Christian who's having his fingernails torn out in the basement of a KGB headquarters in Albania while his wife's being raped in the other room, you'd have a very hard time convincing him that he's not going through the great tribulation. We think it's a tribulation because we get a little mockery and scorn because we put a Bible on the corner of our desk down at the used car lot. I think we might have a hard time explaining that to that bloke. Some little kid stands in front of a tank in Tiananmen Square. He lifts up his arms and says, Here I am. Roll me over. And we want to we see that event as somehow or another having nothing to do with us. But the book of Revelation says this is all about God. And dungeons and dragons and humanity and a bride. The third great theme is about destruction and deception. Look at chapter 13, if you will, just for a moment. I believe that this passage of Scripture, verses 1 and 2 of the 13th chapter of Revelation, are two of the hardest passages of Scripture for modern Americans to read. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. And I stood upon the sand of the sea. Now, let me just say this to you, okay? In the book of Revelation, numbers mean a whole lot of things, but they almost never mean numbers. Mountains mean lots of things, but they almost never mean mountains. Mountains means kingdoms. 
Numbers means ideas, concepts. And the sea is one of the crucial ideas of the book of Revelation. The sea is not an ocean, except that it is the ocean of humanity. Washing, storm-tossed inside the banks of human history. Crashing with hurricane force. Nations, people, tribes, kindred. The sea of humanity in its confusion, and its fear, and its turmoil, and its anxiety, and its sin, and its wars, and its pestilence, and its AIDS, and its hate, and its lust, and its desire for some sense of order to be imposed upon itself. So that the people cry out, who can bring order to this thing? Somebody's got to help us here. Jesus stood on the sand of the sea, and he saw the multitude without a shepherd, and his heart was moved with compassion for them. He said, oh, look, look at this sea. Look at this pitiful ocean. And the sea cries out unto its own godless self, godless self. Who will bring order here? So in the wake of World War I, and I'm political nightmare, geopolitical economic nightmare, devastation of depression, nations rising and falling, little kingdoms fighting civil war, rioting in the streets, economic devastation, racial, ha racial hatred, anti-Semitism, Europe virtually exploding, national pride ravaged and raped, to the Teutonic peoples, said somebody's got to restore law and order. Somebody's got to bring back prosperity. Somebody's got to make some sense of all this thing. Who can help us? So a little old demonized corporal raised up his hand and said, I can. I can restore order and law. And as the Lord liveth, he did. Hitler brought an unparalleled season of law and order that issued forth into the volcanic eruption of World War II. Madness of post-World War II war, the world oceanic sea of humanity said somebody's got to bring us peace who can give us peace? We, we can't see war anymore. We've seen war till we can't stand it. We've seen blood, oceans of blood. We've seen mushroom clouds. We've seen concentration camps. We must see peace. Who can give us peace? So a drunken and debilitated American president, a tired and discouraged British prime minister, and a demonized Russian premier sat in a lonely island in the middle of the ocean and divided up the world. And we had peace. Seventy years of oppressive, tyrannical, monstrous peace that ate people up like bread. And it's gone. Collapsed. How we rejoiced. I remember seeing on CNN as the Berlin Wall was pulled down, a group of Christians at the foot of the wall singing, this is the day that the Lord has made. I will rejoice and be glad in it in German. I remember watching them. Tears streamed down my face. And indeed, it is the day that the Lord has made. And we do indeed rejoice and be glad in it. And now we see nation rising up against nation and people are beating their plowshares into swords and their pruning hooks into spears. Militia against militia, tribe against tribe, village against village. And we are standing, staring into, the, into a possibility of European nightmare. Nightmare of anger, racial hatred, hatred and bitterness and war and internecine strife that is in danger of exploding Europe. And the sea will cry unto itself, who can heal Europe? Somebody's got to heal Europe. Who can restore order? 
and up out of the sea will arise a beast and another beast and a beast and a beast and a beast. Always humanity exalting itself, trusting in its own structures. The beast always arises out of the sea and descends back into the sea. Over and over and over and over again. Will there be an ultimate beast? I, I think so. Is he on the scene today? Who knows? The greater question is, who cares? The beast that I have to face is the only one I have to deal with, and I need a word from God. I need a word from God about Saddam Hussein. I remember a little Ugandan pastor who told me that he saw 100, 150 members, men, women, and children of his congregation, killed before his eyes. While he was in prison in Kampala, military barracks in Kampala, he said every day they'd bring a member of his congregation and stand him before. He told me this scene. Stand them before the bars of his jail every day and they say, if you'll promise not to preach the gospel anymore, we'll let this person live. The whole cosmos has shrunk into the agonized face of one little teenage girl. We'll let her live. If you don't let her live, we're going to kill her now. He said, I am constrained to preach. I will preach. He said they would hold that man, that woman, that child, even a baby, and beat their brains out with hammers till their brains and their blood splattered on his clothes. 150 members of his church, 150 successive days, till he said he was on the point of complete madness. And I said, how did you keep from going mad? I said, I don't think I've got the stuff for that. He said, you do. I said, I don't know. I don't think I could go through that. He said, you can't now. But he said, if you have to, God will give you what you have to have to go through it. I said, how did you keep from going mad? He said, I heard members of my church plead with me, Pastor, tell them anything, but don't let them kill me. And he said, I would look into their faces and I would say, this is not the final answer. This is not the final answer. 150 days. I clung to the cell, the bars of my cell, and said, this is not the final answer. That's what the book of Revelation is about. It's not about trying to figure out whether or not the magnetic band on the back of your MasterCard is the mark of the beast. Shame, shame! It's about telling the tired, discouraged, demoralized, slaughtered, raped church, this is not the final answer! That's what the book is about. It's about a God who says, I'm with you. I'm with you through destruction and deception and through the hurricane force of winds that assault the sea of humanity and toss it in its banks. But then there's another scene. Chapter 14. You can almost hear John say, when I had seen so much that my eyes were weary with the seeing thereof. I said, oh God, I can't see another war. I can't see another beast. I can't see the sea anymore. I can't see the mountains. I can't see fear or destruction or anxiety or slaughter. I can't see any more angels. I can't stand any more of this. God said, wait a minute. Look one more time. Look one more time. And I looked, and lo, a lamb stood on Mount Zion. Isn't that the great proclamation of the church? The church is never at her best when she's electing officers. The church is always at her best when she's waist deep in the bloody sea of repentance and pointing to the lamb. The Baptist said, behold, the lamb of God that taketh away the sin of the world. He aquí el Cordero de Dios que quitar el pecado del mundo. That's the one great proclamation of the church and it's the one great proclamation of the apocalypse. Now you've seen wars and blood, rivers of blood and tyrants and dynasties that came and went and angels and demons, but now lift up your eyes and behold a lamb standing on Mount Zion and with him the redeemed, the ransomed of the earth. Look, 
I'm not going to argue with anybody about whether or not the 144,000 is Jewish evangelists, 12 uh, out of this tribe and a thousand of this tribe, and then also, or whether it's martyrs or any time. You know, the fact of the matter is I'm not going to argue with anybody about anything in this sermon. If you think I'm crazy and nuts or even demonized or often heresy, then I don't know, you're probably right. I just humble myself before you. But for me, it seems manifestly obvious. It's the redeemed of the earth. Those who are his pure, blood-bought, ransomed, redeemed, sanctified bride. Standing with him in the one place where the law and the prophets are fulfilled in the divine sacrifice of Calvary. At rest, and his banner over us is love. When it's all over and when all the shooting is done and when all the bad guys are run out of town and God raises up his bride to stand with him on Mount Zion, we'll say it was all worth it. It was all worth it. The trumpet sounds. We rise to meet him in the air, and I do believe we will. We're transformed in the twinkling of an eye. It doth not yet appear what we shall be. There is nothing in us, even at our best, that gives us any insight into what we shall be when he appears. For when he appears, we shall be like him. <laughs> we shall be like him. Look, I don't know all that the book of Revelation is about. I, I don't understand all the intimate detail of the book. I think that the problem is, though, that a whole lot of people who think they do, they don't know any more than I do. It's just that I know I don't know. But when I get finished with the book of Revelation, every time I read it, every time I go through it, every time I experience it, every time I stand in the middle of that room and watch those pictures spinning around me, when they all stop, it seems to me that no matter in which direction I look, when it all stops, I see a lamb as though slain, yet alive, as though powerless, yet a king, as though crucified, yet conquering. Let me put it to you this way. I have a good friend who was a missionary in uh, Southeast Asia. He made a trip over to India, and while he was there, he wanted to go north and see the Himalayas. He wanted to see mighty Everest. Sort of a dream of a lifetime. He wanted to see the great mountain, tallest mountain in the world. But on the very day, the one day that he had the opportunity to make this trip, the whole area of the world was engulfed in this huge continental fog bank. He was so discouraged. Somebody said, go on and go anyway. You never know. Maybe he'll be able to see. He took a train way to the north of India, then hired a Land Rover and a guide. Said to the guide, there's no use for us to go. I can't see my hand in front of my face. The guide said, you know, Master, it's bigger than you think. Let's go on and go. He said they parked the Land Rover and he actually held the guide by his coattail and followed him, afraid that if he let go of him, he'd lose him in the fog, the blinding snow. As they marched through the mountain paths to this place where they're supposed to have the perfect vantage point to see great Mount Everest. The guide suddenly stopped. He, said, he ran right into the back of him. The guide said, there, Master. There it is. Look. There is Everest. He said he peered through the driving snow and the dense fog and he said he thought he could just make out the outline of a mountain just slightly taller and slightly bigger than all the others. And he said, oh... Oh, he said, I, I think I see it. I think I can make it out just there. That's it, isn't it? He said, the guide laughed, came around behind him and took hold of his temples and said, not down there. He said, look up there. <laughs> see, the devil takes hold of us and of our eyes and he says, look down. Look down at that war. Look down at that tyrant. Look down at the front page of your newspaper. Look down at the plagues. Look down at the locusts. Look down at the AIDS. Look down. 
Look down at the devil. Look down at Lucifer. Look down at the whirling cycle of end-time events that seem to be plunging us toward cataclysm. Look down, look down. And we peer just slightly above the horizon of human history and we hope to catch a glimpse of some political savior, some president that'll make it right, some political party, some idea, some concept, some ism that'll just maybe, just maybe lift us a little bit higher than we've ever been. And the Holy Ghost comes behind us. And with apocalyptic fervor and with the love of the Lamb, he takes hold of our temples and he says, not down there. Look up there. Look up there. What have we to fear? The Lord is on our side. Amen. Because I've placed him at my right hand, because he is ever before me, I shall not be moved. Amen. Look up, brethren. Yeah. Your redemption draweth nigh. Well, let's pray. Come, Holy Ghost, and dispel our every fear. Set us free from the weak, pitiful carnality that drags our eyes earthward. I am resolved no longer to linger, charmed by the world's delights. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these, these have allured my sights. Lead on, O King Eternal. Henceforth in fields of conquest, thy tents shall be our home. In Jesus' wonderful name, who is the strong Son of God. Amen eternally. Even so, come Lord Jesus.